We're good to go. So um, very quickly, everyone, uh, my name is David Wood with Early Music America, and thank you for joining us today uh, for the first of these early music interest sessions, uh, for lack of a better name yet, uh, that we're having right now. So, um, and today, uh, Adam Gilbert is going to be uh, presenting, and we're really happy that everybody could be here. Uh, there are 51 folks on Zoom right now, and we are also streaming live on Facebook. Um, we'll make this available on our YouTube channel afterwards, and we'll be uh, giving some information in our newsletter tomorrow that'll go out on uh, on Tuesday about potential future sessions like this. Um, a few uh, a few sort of housekeeping issues. Everybody right now is on mute except for myself and Adam, and we're going to keep it that way just so there's not background noise. Um, if you have a question and it's easy for you to type, please use the chat function in Zoom. Um, and put that there. If you're on Facebook Live, stick it in there and we'll keep an eye uh, on both sides and we'll try to fit those in. Um, and uh, if it's harder for you to type, uh, for some reason you can use the raise hand function, which is in the participants uh, section there. And if that's the case, um, you can raise your hand and we'll try to find a good place and uh, I can unmute your mic so you can ask the question without having, uh, without having to type. Um, so those are the basics there. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just turn this over to Adam. And All right. Good morning, everybody. I see that uh, David's in a church there. And just so you know, my background is a manuscript from Barcelona. That's Heinrich Isaac's uh, Misa Argentum et Aurum in the background, which is one of my favorite pieces to think about. So I'm going to um, share, start with my PowerPoint, and I'm going to say a couple of things before we start in earnest. Um, one is that if you'll notice, oops, no, let me unshare that because I got to start the very first page and get this right. Um, I'm going to just tell you a couple of things about this as we go. One is that, um, so if you notice, it says here, unless otherwise noted, all polyphony is by AKG. That's me. And what that means is that um, I, we're going to be dealing today with a tenor melody. It's from the 15th century, and there are no actually surviving 15th century settings of that melody. So anything there, just for two reasons you should know this. One is that it's not from the 15th century, it's from the 20th or 21st century. It's just all from the 21st century, right? But it's all done in 15th century style. So it's not like I'm showing you an old piece. There are two places I will show you snippets of pieces composed from the 15th or 16th century. Um, so. I say that for two reasons. I'm not totally worried about somebody using it, but let me know if you're planning on using it because I would hate to show up five years later at another workshop and have somebody say, look at this 15th century piece we're doing because that has happened before. So anyway, everything here is um, based on things I've taught before and based on an article I'm working on. So it's not a big deal, um, but just remember that as we go along. The other thing I want you to know is that, let's see if this is working. I see that I can't quite move my screen, move my, I'm going to have to share this a different way. So bear with me. It all worked fine until just two seconds ago. We're going to share my desktop instead. And so the next thing to know is that a lot of this, I hope that you all will consider as you're going to donate to the Early Music America's Musicians Relief Fund. I'll show the screen at the end as well. Early Music America has been raising money to help people who are in need, and there are quite a lot of them, and there are going to be more. I think you all know that. So if you want more information, there's an email address here, and here's the link also for going. You can go to Early Music America's website, and a lot of people are donating money, and it's going to go to a really important purpose. Also, if you're interested in doing one of these, um, there will be a way to uh, contact David and Early Music America so that you can propose a topic yourself. And if you're somebody in need to propose a topic, boy, that'll be great because they're also going to give small honorarium. I'm donating my service today, woohoo! But other people will also hope to make, make this something that can help you share your work and make some money off of it if you're in, in, in need. Um, so let's go ahead. Um, so everything, the last thing I'll say is this is all going to be oversimplified because we're covering an entire century in you know, an hour or less. So bear with me if I say something a little bit boneheaded because it's oversimplified. So first of all, the 15th century, I like to say is where all the cool kids hung out because this is where lots of things happen. A lot of the techniques we associate with 
common practice happen in the 15th century. The idea of soprano alto tenor bass function is really something that develops in the 15th century as parts of counterpoint. The idea of pervasive imitation, these are techniques that are really developed over the 15th century. So we're kind of gonna walk through the cookbook of what happened in the 15th century. And to, to help me do that, we're gonna enlist the third most popular improvisation tenor of the 15th century, it's called the Petit Rouen. Um, you see it in front of you, it's a Bastance tenor, meaning it's a piece of uh, dance melody that everybody danced to. And this is the tenor melody that one person would play and other people would improvise over it. And so I'm gonna play it for you. You notice each note gets three beats because that's the way the music was. And so I'm just gonna give you, and by the way, if you wanna play along, if you have an instrument, we're at 440, equal temperament. And I'm just gonna let you get a sense of what the melody is here. This is the Petit Rouen melody, has five phrases, each one of eight notes. It's very symmetrical, it's unusually symmetrical. played along. That's beautiful. It was wonderful. Don't you love my sound here? That's actually uh, Finale's acoustic bass sound um, sample. But I'd like to point out a couple of things about our friend here, Petit Rouen. One is that if you look at the first four notes, yum, pum, pa, dum, ut, mi, la, sol, those are actually something really cool. They are the main consonances over a note. So one, three, six, five, are the main consonant notes. So that's actually telling you something. The melody itself probably has a polyphonic origin or the idea of somebody being able to improvise. I could hold that F, boom, and then one, three, six, five are the main consonances over any given note. Another cool thing is if you look at these last four notes, sol, mi, re, u, yes, it's Bruckner, but it's something else. That C, A, G, F, um, hold on, my computer's about to give out. Oh no, I forgot to plug in. Okay, so back to where we were. Sorry about that, folks. If you look, another cool thing about this melody, this sol, mi, re, ut, those last four notes of the first melody are also the last note of the next four phrases. Um, so C, A, G, F, C, A, G, F, that's the end of each phrase. So the first four, the last four notes actually tell you something about the organization. Finally, the very last phrase you may recognize because he, credo in unum deum, it's kind of the credo melody. It's a very common phrase. So anyway, there you go. That's Petit Rouen. And each one of those endings is a clausula, a close or a cadence. Fa, mi, re, ut, okay. So fa mi. Fa mi re. Fa mi re ut. Okay, so that's the that's the melody. And typically you'll see that when somebody's improvising in this period, they want to give you a sense of time. So they actually give you the melody breaking into kind of rhythms. So if you've got an instrument, I think I've made a finale file of this that has a click track of six beats. So you're gonna hear tick, 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 tick. It's beautiful. But if you notice this time, what I did was I did something standard of the Renaissance. I added in the last four bars of each phrase, a cadential figuration. So instead of bum, 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 I went bum, 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 bum. And that's a classic thing, just so you get the idea. That's a classic cadence on ut. Here's another cadence on ut or sol. Here's a cadence on mi. Here's a cadence on re and a classic cadence on ut. So classic, just cadential formula. You're gonna to wanna to know those as we go. But here, just to give you an idea, if you wanna play along, listen for the click track. Oh, no, this one doesn't have a click track. Uh, 
Adam, I don't think your audio okay. is shared right now. Okay, so that's what's, yeah, let's start our share again. Somebody shoot me for having unplugged my computer this morning. Okay, let's see how we're going. There's no click track on this, um, but um, one, two. You guys did a gorgeous job. Now, here's the first thing to know about somebody improvising during the 15th century. From the beginning of the 15th century throughout the entire century, anybody could look at this melody and automatically create a second voice. And the way they would do it was they would start by singing the first note, the main note in unison, octave actually. Um, and they'd sing the first and last note of each phrase as a unison, but they'd be singing an octave higher. And then they would sing, visualize singing a third below every other note. So if I were to create a second melody out of the first phrase, instead of going mi, sol, la, sol, mi, fa, mi, re, ut, I'd go fa, 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 la, fa, so, fa, mi, fa. So I'm really just starting and ending on the main note, but I'm singing a third below. It's really easy to visualize a third below. But in the 15th century, lower voices would be singing in this melody and the person improvising would typically be an octave higher. So their third below would come out sounding a sixth above. And so um, if you look at the second phrase, because yum, bum, bum, that's actually a pretty cadential figure. So you wouldn't go bum, bum, bum. You might, but you have yum, bum, 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 bum. So this is the first thing you could do. You can just visualize a second melody. So this, this melody is called the tenor, the second melody would be called the discantus or the cantus. And I'm gonna show you that this next version of it will have a click track. This is what a basic, a really basic schema for a duo would sound like. And you can play along, you can visualize the top voice and just sing the thirds below if you like, or you can, I mean, visualize the bottom voice, the tenor, and add that top voice by your ear, by your looking or read it as it is, here it goes. a duo and again I've written this out and it's not a beautiful duo you would never hear somebody in the 15th century at the end of the first system just copying what the tenor does but just to give you a sense of the basic procedure is that this second voice is created by visualizing a third below the original voice if you notice here in measures five and six I've created a suspension. That suspension is not necessary, but this is one of those great things about 15th century and Renaissance music. So if we go bum, 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 ba, long, 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 short, short, long, long, you'll all recognize that as a hemiola. 
but it's not bum, 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 bum. It's long, short, short, long, long. And that creates a suspension, a seven, six suspension here. Contrapuntally, it's really just two sixes, a six and a six, but that suspension creates a little added something that's really typical at the end of every phrase, at the end of every cadence clausula. So, so far so good. Any questions? You can create a melody by visualizing a third blow. One common mistake people make is they visualize a third blow, third blow, and third blow, and when they get the end, they still go a third blow. So, yum, bum, 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 but yum, bum, 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 to go back to that unison, which is actually an octave. So, you can see this in music all the way across the 15th century. The contus and tenor, the tenor voice and the one that joins it, the contus, are, they're basically, they're, they're like partners, they've gotten together, they're actually in isolation together. They're socially distancing from everybody else and they do their thing together. Why some ficta, I've asked. Well, ficta of this kind, there's all the sharps and the naturals I've added, none of them are necessary because they're not creating any clashes. I've added them because they're typically common at a cadence. The one at measure set 18, yes, I probably should have put it at measure 10 and not at 18, but. I was getting sleepy. But this cadence at measure um, 14 and the one at measure 30, these are classic things that people just automatically do. They might not sing sol, F sharp, sol, they may sol, fa, sol. They sing the original syllables, but they sharpen the note just for the case of beauty. That's a typical thing to do in counterpoint. Okay, so from the early century, people could do this. But next thing would happen was somebody else would say, wait a second. I can sing a third voice. And um, so question, does this work a lot more complex when the canis firma skips a lot? Yes, this is actually an interesting question. A lot of this style you'll see in fairly simple chant um, formulas, but you can use this in a, in a lot of pieces. Now, bear with me. Um, the next thing I can do, and I'm gonna try this a little bit, is I can create a third melody out of this. And the way I create the third melody is I do exactly what that second melody did, but I sing a fourth lower than that. And one of the things you may know, you may have that friend who says, oh, I can't carry a tune. Well, actually, sometimes that person can't carry a tune at the pitch they're at. They're really good at singing about a fourth below or a fifth higher. And so this is essentially what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna add a thir third voice that is basically singing the same way the top voice does, visualizing the same way, citing the tenor voice by singing a third lower, but being an octave higher. So I'm gonna make the third voice and I'll just see how this works. So here we go. So if I go bom, 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 bom. the idea that's basically that's basically what we is called an English organ or fa burden or fa burden and so here is visualizing a version this is kind of oversimplified version of le petit rouen in fa burden style fa burden style I think I have a click track for this let's see how it sounds if you'd like to join along so you notice the top two voices are exactly the same they didn't even have to write out the top two voices. They would write out just the top voice and say Faubourdon, meaning also do it a fourth lower. So here you go. So that's basically Faubourdon style. Now, what that means is that, again, I'm, I'm just doing the top voice as a discantus voice, and the third voice is just a fourth lower. You notice that my middle voice doesn't have a flat. That's because it's doing a, a fa, mi, fa, fa, mi, fa. It's doing the same syllables, even. The singer would just sing the same psalmization. Some people might, at measure eight, choose to do an F sharp in the, in the second voice. 
And we think that earlier on they did more F sharps and somewhere in the 1410s, 20s, 30s, they stopped doing as many. By 1450s, you start to see a lot of contrapuntal things where somebody's not doing an F sharp with a B natural, they're just doing an F natural. It creates a diminished sonority. That's still actually allowed in counterpoint today. Um, so I'm hearing a question. Ah, you don't see the last note of each line. Well, let's see what I can do about that. Um, you might change your computer resolution. Maybe David has a solution for that. Yeah, I think that's just mostly uh, computer by computer based, depends on how big your screen is and what application you're on, um, that, that type of thing. Uh, so that's, uh, it's less, less of a Zoom issue. Um, and uh, in some applications, your menu will uh, disappear if you're not mousing over the screen and that kind of stuff. Yeah, okay, somebody says much better now. I think somebody fixed it. Okay, cool, great. So this is Faubourdon style, and it's really typical of music of the period to have cadences that end like this. So, so going out to a fifth and an octave. Um, but you notice again, always each phrase ends and begins at a unison and an octave. Now, here is, something that happened. What you see in front of your screen now is called low contrast style. And that is not um, what they called this back then. Um, so what they called this back then was just, they called the first, the main note, the tenor, voice, the tenor, they called the top voice, the contus. And then that third voice, they called the contra tenor, the voice against the tenor. Um, when it's moving in Faubourdon style, they just call the contra tenor. But by starting about 1425, and, and really up to 1450, 60, into 1470, um, across, the, across the course of um, 20, 25 years, they started dropping the contra tenor lower. And they didn't call it a low contrast back then. That's what musicologists call it now, because they're trying to say, oh, well, this piece has a low contra as opposed to a high contra. But they just called it the contra tenor voice. But they started dropping it lower. And the way they did it was they made it a new procedure, instead of going parallel fourths below the top voice, they started thinking in terms of the tenor voice more. Also, by, by going three below, five below. So you're gonna see a lot of places where it's either a fifth above in the first note, then it goes to unison, then it goes to, okay, in this case, six below, but then you get five, three, five, five above. Three, five, three, five, three, five. You're gonna get a lot of five threes below. And this is what the contra tenor voice did. Uh, Flory, if you're a harp player, the contra tenor playing the harp would see a tenor and just go three, five, three, five. It starts to sound like bells and things like that. So here's, here's the low contra style. Here we go. I think it'll be a click track here for two measures. again. So that's low contra tenor style. You see it's almost exactly the same tenor and contus, the same top two voices, but now that contra is dropped lower and it starts to have this quality of always when you're going three, five, three, five below, you'll notice at measure um, six here, there's a B flat. Yum, bum, 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 bum. And then notice something else here, the end of the first system at measure eight, three, six, five, this six below the tenor was not actually officially a consonance, but they started using it. And it starts becoming, 
this kind of ornamental thing. And, but officially it wasn't considered to consonants. You would uh, typically three, five below, one, three, five, an octave below are the real consonants. So let's hear this one more time. And if you want to play along, go ahead. Oops. So you might notice that that little moment I talked about at measure eight going a six, five below, that's something the contratenor would start to do at cadences. And also at measure 16, the contratenor's job was also to do kind of a bridge to get across to the next phrase. I'm circling that if you can see that. But that little moment right at measure eight is something that once that started to happen, things started to happen between the contratenor and the top voice. If you look at measure five right here, I'm circling, Look at what the tenor and the top voice are doing, the contratenor and the top voice are doing. They're going in parallel thirds, actually parallel tenths apart from each other. And that started to be something that people started to do. Um, oh, great question. Is there a reason for the lower voice to switch an octave at the last note? Musicologists call that the octave leap cadence. So nowadays we go one, five, one. But back then they were still used to having that voice end Yum, bum, bum. So they go one, five, five above. We call that an octave leap cadence. That's the first thing they did when they switched lower. They dropped lower, but they left that final note being a fifth above the tenor. Gradually, you'll start to see instead of bum, 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 the circle bum, 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 or bum, bum, bum. Another thing they could do is three, five, three below, five below, three below. So that's another thing they could do as well. So that's a great question. They just were used to having that be the final sonority, and then they started playing with other things. So again, I've oversimplified it. They did quite a lot of things, right? Okay, cool. So once they started doing this kind of parallel tense, it looks like parallel thirds between the outer voices, that became a whole style. And by the time we hit the 1480s, people are starting to do this thing, and they're starting to be really excited about it. Um, in the 1480s, uh, uh, theorist uh, Guillermus Monacos, William the Monk, called it decime, which means tense. Um, Francina Scafurius described this as processus celebratus, which I used to translate badly as celebrated procedure, famous, really great stuff, but actually it just means a really common thing. And he listed all the great composers like Isaac and Josquin and Compare that were doing it. And the way you, this works, if you notice, is that if you have here in the tenor this D above it, D, da, 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 six, five, six, five, da, six, six, five, six, five. When there's a six, five and six, five above a tenor, the bass below can go, the contra below can go five, six, five, six, da, da, dum, bum, bum, bum. And they go in parallel tense and they're doing their consonants as against. So if you take a look at that, the way that works, I'm gonna show you that now in, in um, Petit Rouen. And this is an imagined version of Petit Rouen, which, which really what we call dogged parallel tense. Um, I think Richard Taruskin is known to have called parallel tense this procedure bargain basement counterpoint, because you can just keep two voices going around something. And remember, it works that when there's a six above the tenor, the contra below is a five below. And then when the top voice drops a five above the tenor, the contra drops a six below. And so here is an imagined version of Petit Rouen. I'm going to give you a click track if you want to play along because, hey.
So let's point out just a couple of things about this little feature. Um, if you'll notice, one of the cool things, by the way, every lick here is stolen straight out of the 15th century, I promise you. There's nothing like totally modern in here, but there might be some like goofy idea. But if you notice at measure four on the top of yum, but a bd bd bom, that famous figure is sometimes called the Tondernaken figure. Agricola used it, but it's also considered sometimes a signature of Anton Dunois, the composer of songs from the 15th century. So yum, but a bd bd bom, that's a nice way of getting from a six above down to a unison or from an octave down to a third. Yum, bitty, 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 boom. That's a lick that everybody kind of had in their pocket. Um, so you could just memorize, that's one way to get from, get, get down a sixth. And another thing is this little figure here at measure two. Boom, 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 ba da ba boom, 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 triadic figure outlines things. But here's my favorite thing. Look at measure one. Boom, 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 boom. That actually does two things. It uses the tenor melody the first four notes of the tenor melody. And in doing so, it actually comes at the second note of the tenor melody in contrary motion. I have no idea if somebody did this in the 15th century, but I'm sure they did. So I bet this was probably a common way of actually opening settings of Petit Rouen. Um, somewhere, somebody at some point did that. And you'll notice that when I go bum, 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 ba da ba dum in measure two, bum, bum, ba, ba da ba dum, the contra does the same thing, a tenth lower. And you'll start to see kind of these um, features. If you look at measure seven, yum, ba ba bum, bum, bum. That's a favorite contratenor thing to do, which is go six, da da, three below, ba ba, six, five, a. I can't sing it, yum, ba ba bum, bum, bum. That little figure is typical at the end of phrases. And I have to tell you, two people that love to do that are Johannes Gieselin. That's just, Johannes Gieselin loves to do that, and so does. And so does Heine von Giesegem. So it's a Gieselin and Giesegem figure. They both love that figure. Um, another thing you'll see with features, with pieces like this, is they'll make something happen, not on the downbeat, but a pattern will happen over the downbeat. So often, if you look at the very last two measures in here, um, they'll look at the top of yum, bum, 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 bum. It's actually not like that. It's yum, bum, bee, bum, 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 bum meaning the pattern of the accent starts um, at the last note of a pattern. So you're gonna see a lot of things that go over the bar line. Syncopations, the tenor is keeping itself solid, but the other ones are playing against it. And you'll see also a lot of things tossing up against that kind of figure is great um, feature that goes with style. You wanna try it again? Let's try it again. If you got your instruments out, um, gonna get that quick track, here we go. Stephen Block, you're right. My caption needs to change to lower voice below the tenor, not above. <laughs> um, I need a drink too. Okay, uh, so another thing you'll see is that because of the rules of consonants, certain melodic shapes, yum, ba bum, 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 ba bum, you're going to see that figure come back and bum, 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 ba da ba dum, bum, 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 to be imitative. Um, you'll also see at the last measure, last two measures, a gratuitous yum, ba ba bum, bum, ba ba bum. 
That's just outlining the consonances. That's a typical thing people do. Now, so that's a feature that you see this style in the 1480s and 1490s as being like the latest thing. But already by the 1470s, once we drop that contratenor low to a lower contratenor as opposed to between the tenor and the top voice, we get an option for adding another voice. And this is the kind of the birth of what I call the soprano alto tenor bass. And what that means, and I'm, I will add to these, I'll label these later. This third voice is now still the tenor. You might recognize it. Bom, 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 bom. And the top voice is still pretty much the same. Yum, bom, 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 bom. A little more florid just because I wanted to be exciting. But now you still have that contratenor voice below, but it's got a new friend. And that's a contratenor voice above the tenor. Sometimes it goes below, but it's typically above. And so what happened was they started saying, okay, I'm gonna play the tenor today. And somebody else says, I'm gonna play the contus today. And somebody says, so Joe, what are you gonna play? He says, I'm gonna play the contra. Well, which one? I'm gonna play the low contra. And so because he's speaking in Italian or in Latin, he's gonna say contra tenor bassos or basso. And so he says, which one are you gonna? I'm, I'm gonna do the altos or the alto. So this is called contra tenor bassus, and this is called contra tenor altus, meaning the low contra and the high contra. By the time they did this for a while, it got a little tiring, so they just said, I'm doing the bassus and I'm doing the altus. Um, and this is important because we typically think of soprano, alto, tenor, bass as voice ranges, recorder ranges, but actually they're contrapuntal functions. And what's important to know is that when you have a cadence, when the Basus, that low voice is going three below, five below, the, as in measure three here, the altus is married to the bass. The altus is going five above, octave above, five above, octave above. And so they're really working together. So you kind of have now finally have a good game of, um, of uh, bridge going on here. We've got two pairs. And this is a um, setting uh, imagined of Petit Rouen with four voices. And you'll notice at the end of at every cadence, I've done something what I call gratuitous parallel tense. You know, just because you can, that's kind of a typical thing to have the altus and the basus do that little wiggle in the phrases. So here we go. If you want to join along, you can join with this. If you notice the very last note of the altos, it goes yum, bum, 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 and gives you two notes. What we think they did, because often they're written that the bottom note is yum, bum, 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 because it really wants to get to that fifth again, because that's a perfect sonority. I like to call that the smile at the end of a 15th century piece of music. Yum, bum, 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 jazz hands. Okay, so that is the basic sonorities of going from one voice to two voice, to three voices in fa burden, fo burden style with parallels, to going to low contra, and then that idea of going parallel tense and wiggling all over the place. And finally, this is a very common sonority, what we just played, which you would expect to hear around 1500. So that's sort of basic, simple counterpoint. But I thought I'd talk to you about another thing that happens really commonly in the 15th century is the development of really systematic imitation. And the word for imitation is called fuga. Fuga meaning to chase or to flee. And there's not a term for different kinds of fuga per se, just fuga is imitation. And so what I have for you here now is a canon. And, and people sometimes mistake the word canon for, for imitation. Canon just means a rule by which you imitate. In this case, I've written a piece that is a canon for four voices. And one of the cool ways to write a canon back then is to make a module, bom, 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 bom. You see that first four notes. That's just a tenor function at the end of a phrase. Then you answer it with a contus function. Yum, ba, ba, bum, 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 bum. And so the next module is a contus function. And the next module, bum, 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 is a basus function. And then the last module is just an altus. So one of the classic ways to write imitation is in modules. We sometimes call this modular imitation. But you see the great way you'll see often do it is somebody will do a phrase that is a tenor phrase because they've 
They have tenor cadence function followed by a conscious tenor function. By the way, you might recognize the first four notes as the beginning of the tenor of the famous song to be playing. But here we go. You can see how this goes and join along. The first I'm going to play it by itself and then make it canonic. Okay, so here's the cool trick about this. You can take any piece with four voices and make a canon by starting with one of the voices and then as it, then it takes the same phrase measure of another voice while the other voice enters. So you can take a single uh, a cadence and turn it into a modular imitation or a canon like row, row, row your boat. So this is a typical way of starting a piece of music is by having something imitate. And um, another type of imitation, though, is close fuga or strutto fuga, which means stressed. And the kinds of close fuga mean, okay, for instance, if I'm doing imitated unison or octave, I kind of have to wait two pitches. Otherwise, I'm going to get a crunch between that F and the G. So this is a classic way of making an imitation. Another one is taking a pattern that's sequential and entering after it. At the fifth is interesting because if I go up a step at the fifth, I can start a fifth, a, a one note later at the fifth, but then I can go down a third. And this is a cool thing because if you know that when you're a fuga at the fifth, one note apart, you can go up stepwise and down a third. However, if you're at the fourth, because it's an inverted interval, you can go down stepwise and up a third. And you can do the same thing now in the third system as being at the fifth with suspensions, meaning I start with a G, I come in with a, a, a D, I come in with a G below a fifth, and then I go up a step, so it's really, again, that five, six, three, five, six, three. And the fourth works exactly the same backwards. I'm gonna play you all, all four of these systems just so you get a sense of close imitation. Where's my melody? Oh, I don't have it, I forgot to load it. Well, um, let me see if I can find that on my computer and you'll forgive me for just a moment. Well, I won't find it. Not, not before you guys all fall asleep wondering what happened to me. Okay, so here's another kind of canon um, or imitation, which is mensuration canon, mensural canon. This is from Josquin, Misa La Marme, Super Voces Musicales. And that's where you have one melody, yum, pom, 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 ping, pom, pom. And you do the same melody at a different speed at the same time. Yum, pom, 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 ping, pom, pom. And once you've done that, those first four notes, then the rest is just gravy. He just adds whatever works for those added notes. Here it goes. It's just a fragment from that whole mass movement. So let me give it a little sense of what happens if you do Petit Rouen as an imitative melody. And I suspect it one, oh, here's one more technique, which is the famous um, fuga ad minimum. We also call this the dragnet fuga. Yum, ba -bum, bum, bum, ba -bum, bum, that kind of figure. This is Josquin's setting of, um, of the tubian plane, and this is performed by Fretwork, just a little fragment of it. <laughs> get the idea? So here's Petit Rouen imagined as an imitative duo. And I suspect somewhere along the way, this melody was used imitatively. That's just totally speculation. But the fact that it works so well, here's a classic duo imagined out of Petit Rouen. Okay, a little altered, but you'll get the idea.
So that's a really classic procedure of one voice enters, especially the top voice, and then the tenor voice enters. And that way, the top voice is ready to land the cadence earlier. Ya da da bum bum, while the tenor goes ya da 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 dum. Um, by the way, I'm looking at older note, the four voice style. Um, Peter says it looks like falso burdon. Actually, that's exactly falso burdone. The words fa burden, fo burdon, falso burdon refer to related techniques, and they're sometimes used interchangeably and messily here. So, oh, you can't see the bottom? Okay, that might be. Um, so, I'll just play that a little bit just for you to get the idea. You notice how the top voice enters. By the way, here's the cool thing. Once you do something like this, you can make your cadences in fa burden style with a, with a contra tenor voice in between, in low contra tenor style, or in four voices. So, just one more time on that. So you can make a contra tenor that's between, but low. I, you guys can play around with that if you like. Now, there's one other thing. This is a concept of three loves six and six loves three. I won't spend too much time on this. I'll let you guys look at it later. But once I'm in parallel thirds, if you notice here in the first system, I can jump from three to six, and then I'm in sixth. And if I'm in thirds, I can jump from three to six. If I'm in sixes, the voice below can jump up to a third below. And this is what I call the knitting and weaving of counterpoint. It's a great way to get you from one interval to another. This is standard material because you want to save those fifths and octaves until you get to the end of a phrase. So this is a really cool just kind of device to practice. I won't spend too much time on that. And um, here is also finally um, just sort of classic uh, four voice cadences. I'm not going to do these now forever, but just give you a look, look at those. You can have these for your Thing. This is the kind of thing that um, performers and composers just knew these voices by like the back of their hand. And for that matter, I've done an earlier session with some of you guys in which basically, if you look at the cadences, these cadences are really nothing more than the outline for green sleeves um, and uh, the Romanesca. So just four chord progressions. If you notice here in this bottom version, here's Here's the tenor, yum, pom, 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 three below, five below, three below, five below, three. So there you go. Um, so the basic cadential functions from the 15th century also become the ground of the ground bass. So um, I think that's about it for today. And I just have one more little thing if I'll save that. So here you go. Donate to Early Music America's Musicians Relief Fund. I bet some people have questions or comments, and I'm going to welcome any comments, both publicly and privately. Um, if you want to let David know if you think of good ideas for this session, et cetera, or things that can make it work better besides me plugging in my computer before it starts. I got that one figured out now. Yeah, we're going to thank you so much, uh, Adam. And we, uh, we are going to be uh, putting a form out uh, either later today or tomorrow for suggestions for future interest sessions. Um, it is our plan at this moment uh, for uh, interest sessions that are accepted for the presenter to receive a small honorarium for doing that. Um, so please do keep an eye out for that. There'll be a small um, uh, proposal form. And the idea is that we can present maybe one of these a week going forward for a while and we'll have some other alternatives uh, to time to get together as the early music community. And do please um, go to the We Are Early Music campaign page uh, and contribute if you can. We're helping uh, early music artists in need. All who uh, have applied and uh, fit into uh, the, the right stipulations are receiving $250 a piece. Uh, we have just notified the first 100 artists uh, of their, of their um, funds that they'll be receiving and we're continuing to raise money toward that. Every single dollar that is donated through our website or through the Facebook uh, uh, donation campaign will go straight to artists. Uh, EMA isn't keeping any of that money. So if you can donate even, uh, even a small amount, uh, every bit will help to keep 
uh, all the artists who were impacted during this during this time um, in at least a, a tiny bit better uh, better place. Thank you, everyone. Right. Uh, are there any questions yes, right I've now? Got, I've, I got a lot of comments here, and I'm going to respond to a few things. Um, uh, one is I know that sometimes the, the, the pages change slowly. You know, even though I'm wired in the house, my, I normally get like 40 megabits per second right now. I'm getting about four today because everybody's on the internet. Every school is going online. And as a matter of fact, I've got a spouse teaching right now online. Um, so things are a little slow and I really thank you for your patience. Um, I'm learning how to do this. So this is a great experience for me to figure out what works and what doesn't. Some people have asked about can we have PDFs or online? I have put on a Dropbox with David, um, my keynote presentation with the sound. I put, um, uh, I put a PowerPoint presentation. I'm gonna remove the sound files for the ones that are from other recordings because I don't wanna use somebody else's copyright material. Um, and I also have a PDF available as well. Now, as far as the pieces of music, if you're interested in those, I also will put PDFs with David. David will have some place people can access these, is that correct? Yes, uh, we'll we'll have a place from uh, we have a we have a, a responding COVID nineteen page on the website. We'll make sure to have a link to there to the interest sessions. We'll also do that in the Facebook group if you're following that. Um, and I believe I can send follow up messages to everyone who has participated who is on the Zoom call right now if, because you registered for this. So I should be able to send uh, a an email out to everyone with a link to that Dropbox folder with all of the documents. Uh, right. For right I, now. I think in the future, I'll make a tiny URL version of things like this as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you, you can access it directly. And hi, Mary Waldo, Mary Halverson Waldo. Yes, we did record this, I believe. So the recording will be available as well. Um, and again, thank everybody for your patience because uh, it's it's funny doing this when you, you know people are there, but you can't see them or hear them as you go because it's just the way it is. So you always want to, you remember, I can't tell that joke I tell in class. And then you realize that joke wasn't funny anyway. The students were just pretending to laugh. So. Um, and um, we will have this archived, uh, the live stream that was on Facebook will stay there on Facebook and we will get the file from Zoom and upload that to our YouTube channel. Um, we'll do that as soon as we can. Uh, it'll be a rather large file and uh, not having access to uh, the university campus that I would normally use to upload that. It may be a couple of days uh, before we actually get that uploaded, uh, but we'll do that and we'll post that to our website uh, and link to it from our various social media. Uh, and we'll create a home for these, these interest sessions so that you can come and take a look. And we have a few other past webinars. And so there's a webinar playlist on our YouTube channel and we'll make sure that this is added to that as well. I just want to share with Brian Bingham that you are all indeed in tune. Brian, however, at measure 17, one of your notes was slightly off. I'm sure I heard that. <laughs> uh, that was a joke. Um, and also, yes, I, I have been writing a book on 15th century counterpoint, kind of based on some of this in the presentation. It got a little sidetracked because I discovered some other stuff that's really cool. And of course, when you discover one thing, you're going, so maybe another time I'll share with you my interesting discoveries about uh, the other kind of imitation I forgot to talk about, which is a uh, retrograde canon, which is really cool. Um, but that's, that's, that's a, for another day. And uh, so, yes, I will encourage you all to, to go take a look right away at one of your favorite 15th century pieces of music and see if you can find these techniques. For me, what's interesting is to say, when I know how to do these things, um, uh, then I see them in a piece of music. You know, we talk about analysis, what chord is there, what's this? Um, the next step is how did it get there? And you learn a lot by doing that. And one of the things I did when I was working on my dissertation on Isaac's music was I spent time trying to write like Isaac. And I, I don't know what people did in the 15th century, but I know what they could and couldn't do because you, you take a melodic pattern, it works for a while, and then it stops working. And you learn a lot by, uh, about what people were doing, how and why they were doing it by trying to do it. So go take a look at your favorite piece and see if you can find uh, contratenor with thirds and fifths below, if you can find Faubourdon. Got to tell you one more thing, trivia. Faubourdon became associated with a symbolic feature of the sound of the bees buzzing, uh, the three voices in parallel six, thirds and sixths, the bees buzzing like the disciples going after Christ like the bees after honey. And Willem Elders once wrote that, and I thought, well, maybe Willem Elders has gone a little too far. But then one day I was looking at a piece of music from the 16th century, a motet by Francesco Loyola, and right where it says, sweet like honey, suddenly all the voices went into Faubourdon. 
So every one of these techniques also took on a kind of, took on a kind of a viral meaning as well. Oh, there's a word. Um, <laughs> yes, patterns. So thank you, everybody. Any other questions or comments? I wish we could all go off of mute and just chat together forever now because that's the coolest part, but there's so many of us. But I hope you continue um, coming to do these and see these and keep supporting your friends because, and your colleagues because these are the times where we really need everybody to step up and support your community and we thank you. Yes, thank you everyone. Uh, well, yes. We will, uh, thank you Adam, and we will also uh, send those files out as soon as we can. Uh, if you don't already receive email communication from EMA and you'd like to be notified of uh, future sessions like this and our other uh, upcoming activities, if you go to earlymusicamerica.org at the bottom of that page, there's a button that says sign up for email updates from EMA. And it's really quick and easy to, uh, to get that and to be notified from us uh, whenever these come along. So Great. thank you all. Wait, but before you go, yes. Carolyn Wallace made a lovely comment about she thinks that I would have heard her good notes and her bad notes. <laughs> and I just want to say something spiritual, which is that everything we do is like a piece of music, a note that goes out forever. And both our good notes and our bad notes, but later the bad notes matter less than the good notes. They all kind of go out with something and we're all resonating outwards. So keep doing that, keep playing, keep making music together and be well, everybody. All right, thank okay. you everyone. Thank you. All right.